So like Sydney said, I'm a managing editor at Top 500 News, which basically shares a website with the Top 500 list. We've implemented a, a news site which covers HPC, so not just the not just the top 500 systems, but everything HPC, including machine learning, the adjacent hyperscale space, every, everything uh, high performance. Um, I'm doing this, though, on behalf of Intersect 360 Research, where I used to work, and I'm still involved with uh, the CEO of Intersect 360, Addison Snell. We do a podcast on HPC News every uh, Thursday or Friday and post it up on Monday. We've been doing that, I think, for about 10 years now. And uh, Addison couldn't make it to Europe uh, this time around, so he sent me. And I am learning to appreciate Europe even more and more as over the past three months. So I love being here. Um, so let's start. Here's a little commercial for Intersect 360 Research, basically what it does. It's been in the business for 10 years in the HPC market research space. Um, it uh, does uh, user-side data quite a bit, that's its emphasis, and it's recently branched out into hyperscale, which is an adjacent market to high-performance computing. Like I said, we do a weekly podcast, or I do a weekly podcast with Addison every, uh, every week, and, uh, and that's been posted uh, on the Top 500 website as well as the Intersect 360 site. And I think you can get that on iTunes and Stitcher if you want to download it, which apparently people do. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, so the key trends that we're going to talk about today, uh, the ones that are most recent for this year, architecture specialization, HPC in the cloud, and hyperscale machine learning and AI. The, I think all these subjects have been discussed here uh, during this meeting, so we'll We'll delve a little deeper into these from the market perspective. Uh, one of the things Intersect 360 Research did uh, last year was do a survey of HPC users on sort of how they viewed the different uh, processor architectures uh, sort of on a forward-looking way. And here's sort of the results they got. Um, I think the most interesting data points here are probably the way they're viewing uh, the accelerators, uh, specifically the NVIDIA GPUs and Xeon Phi's. And you can sort of see that it's reflected that the NVIDIA GPUs are still sort of have the dominant mind share here. Uh, they've been around longer. Xeon Phi's are much newer, a smaller ecosystem, smaller customer base, but actually coming up pretty fast. You can probably see that the Xeon Phi's will eat into the market share of NVIDIA uh, as, as we progress, but the actual balance between those two is, is to be determined. Uh, another interesting data point here uh, that we're going to talk a little bit more about is the, the view of ARM and, uh, and open power as future architectures. These are sort of up and coming. They want to sort of dent or they want to uh, take a, some market share away from Intel in the x86 space. ARM is, is seen as slightly favorable here, and it looks like power and open power is basically broken even. Um, this is sort of in motion. Remember, this is still last year, so it's, it's probably six-month-old data. But that's, that's the, sort of the view from uh, the user community at this point. FPGAs do not have a favorable rating at this point. Um, but as we'll talk later, the, uh, that, that could change actually pretty dramatically. Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I think they'll be blunted a little bit on, on, on some of these sides, but basically I think some of the favorability, unfavorability for some of the newer emerging architectures will, will shift into the favorable area just because of some things that have occurred over the last six to eight months. But I don't even know if Intersect 360 is going to do another uh, server like this. This is a special study, I think, commissioned by a set of... Um, uh, set of vendors, so uh, I'm not sure if they're going to update this study, but that would be interesting to see how it's going forward. Um, but this is sort of that snapshot uh, as of uh, the, 
probably think middle of 2016. Um, delving a little bit deeper, here's, the, here's how people are viewing the open power ecosystem at this point, which is actually pretty favorable. I mean, there's, there's people saying, more than 10% of people saying they'll definitely use those. So uh, that's not the case today. Um, they have a much smaller share of, of the HPC uh, server space. And there's another 40% that's saying they're gonna evaluate it. So basically more than half the people are either looking at it or are evaluating open power and power. Um, ARM is very similar. About half the people are gonna say they're evaluating it and more than 10% are saying they're definitely gonna use it. So it's a little bit more favorable, but again in the same ballpark as, as open power. Um, my general impression from covering this space over the last couple of years is there's a lot more interest in ARM, especially in Europe. Um, there's been, you know, the sort of the very famous research project, the Mont Blanc project, uh, that's being funded by the EU to, to build up uh, ARM expertise looking, for, looking forward to exascale systems. There was the recent um, launch of uh, the ARM-based system in the UK is some BARD, which was actually built by Cray. Uh, that's the first really big ARM-based supercomputer. Um, Europe seems very determined to build ARM supercomputers, and I think they are actually looking to develop sort of the, an indigenous um, capability and have, have one or more companies develop ARM-based implementations looking towards exascale supercomputing. And, more generally, sub scale supercomputing. Um, there's also the post-K supercomputer being done in Japan. That's gonna be an ARM system um, done by Fujitsu with uh, the vector processor extension there. So that's Japan's first uh, exascale system will also be ARM. Um, in the US, I think it's more mixed, but there is, obviously, there's interest in ARM here. People talk about it quite a bit, and there's a number of vendors in the field that are pushing ahead. And the fact that Cray is, is involved, I think, uh, will sort of push this forward as well. Open Power um, has some, uh, has a few uh, uh, smaller scale deployments in the HPC area. So there's more actual systems of Open Power in HPC today. And of course, there's gonna be the two big coral systems for the U.S. Department of Energy coming up late this year, early next year. Those are the big Hunter Plus Petafop systems. Those are going to be power-based uh, power uh, with, with GPUs, but they're sort of missing sort of that middle spot right now, um, and it's not sure how, how they're going to sort of fill in those gaps. So it's, it's an interesting, the, the ARM open power dynamic is pretty interesting, especially when you look at what Intel's doing. So. It, 2017, 18 are gonna be interesting years to see how sort of those architectures start to compete in the market. Um, as we go to accelerators, we see NVIDIA still dominating the space by quite a bit, but uh, with the introduction of Xeon Phi, uh, they're starting to, to take market share away from NVIDIA or at least expand the market in, in, in that area. Um, I think this is sort of, everybody sort of knows that, I think. The, the interesting uh, sort of factoid here is that FPGAs are, are account for a very minor part of systems deployed 2%. Um, but there's sort of the dark ho horse here. As far as getting into systems that are gonna do physics simulations, probably not anytime soon, but where they're looking to be strong is, is what people have talked about here today. And, doing uh, inferencing of, of AI systems. Now, obviously, Intel uh, has invested heavily in this. They bought Altera. They think 30% of all systems in the data center are gonna be FPGA accelerated within the next, uh, or by 2020, so within the next three years. That's pretty aggressive. Not all of those FPGAs are gonna be doing HPC. Um, probably very few, but a lot of them will be doing inferencing and compression and uh, things like that. Uh, the most interesting story this year that I covered about FPGAs was Microsoft. They've implemented FPGAs throughout their cloud. It sounds like they've got FPGAs in basically every server in their cloud infrastructure, and they demonstrated basically an exascale system on that, doing um, 
the demonstration was uh, language translation. It translated Wikipedia. And I think the, uh, they showed it, it took like four hours to do uh, that with a four FPGA system. But when they scaled it up to their whole infrastructure, they translated Wikipedia in about a tenth of a second. So that was a pretty impressive demonstration. And in a sense, you can consider that the first exascale system. It wasn't double precision floating point. It was exa-ops. But uh, <clears throat> it was certainly done at a level that nobody's ever done that before. So very interesting developments in the FPGA area, which may leak into more traditional supercomputing. Um, Here's the interconnect space as looking forward. Again, no surprises here. Mellanox sort of dominates the space on the system interconnect side. And it's also pretty well represented on the uh, storage interconnect side. It's, when you go out to the LAN, that's basically Cisco and Ethernet. Um, Omnipath is, is penetrating this market slowly. Uh, Intersex 360 at least expects Omnipath to increase this year as the as the technology becomes better known and, uh, and more, more common. So we'll see. It's basically an offload, onload type uh, rivalry going on there. And some applications may be better on one or the other. But uh, it's, it's interesting to have competition now against InfiniBand. So it's, it's an interesting few years as these two battle it out. Um, I'm going to skip this one. I'm getting hungry. Uh, <laughs> Here's the total HPC market uh, as projected by Intersect 360 Research. We're sitting at about uh, a little over $30 billion in revenue for everything in HPC this, this year. Uh, it's about a 5% CAGR growth rate. So it'll be in 2020, it'll be somewhere up near $37 billion. Uh, at least that's, that's their projection. We have to remember those numbers as we look at some of these other slides. Uh, storage is actually the largest or the fastest growing area. Um, servers are still the biggest area, and they'll be basically they'll be a third of of the total spend throughout this period. The hyperscale market. So this is interesting. Intersect 360 uh, started looking at the hyperscale as a separate market uh, last year. Uh, they used to include it under something they called ultra-scale internet. It was sort of in their business side of HPC, but they realized it had evolved. It had become a distinct market with a different application set and a different whole set of users. So essentially, it's an adjacent market to HPC that is driven by very similar demands, which is performance, especially performance per watt, and scalability. So it, it tends to use the same technologies as HPC, and they're, they're cross-pollinating each other. So uh, we'll see they're, they're sort of affecting each other in interesting ways. But um, there's, there's still, uh, it's, it's actually, well, we'll see how big a market it is or how much uh, Intersect 360 thinks it is. So uh, they're still working on this, but they have an initial sort of cut at it they think it's a $35 billion market today, most of which is stuck at the high end, basically the big eight hyperscale companies, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and the other five, um, 20 billion. So, and then they have a, a three tiers of uh, hyperscale, and it adds up to about 35 billion, which is bigger than the HPC market today. In fact, that's as big as the HPC market will be in five years. And the hyperscale market is growing faster than HPC. So uh, it's sort of an interesting uh, market to study for, for Intersect, and uh, they're trying to get a handle on it. Um, deep learning, big subject. So we've heard a lot about it this, uh, this past few days. Intersect 360 is tracking AI, which includes deep learning, cognitive computing, all the other buzzwords. But they're doing it as part of the hyperscale market because a lot of the, certainly a lot of the initial work is being done by the hyperscale companies. Um, this is where, as I cover this space, I sort of diverge from the way Intersect 360 sees this, especially uh, considering some of the recent developments and, and what we've heard in the past few days that 
deep learning and these AI technologies are, are becoming well ensconced in, um, in HPC uh, proper and, uh, and in supercomputing standards. In fact, there's, well, we've heard like, in, um, you know, just uh, in the past few days, the, the different keynotes talked about drug discovery. I mean, there's, there's seismic modeling, there's weather prediction, all of those deep learning codes that are actually uh, propagating across most of the domains that HPC covers now, financial portfolio analysis. Basically, anything that has an analytics bent to it is going to be infused with AI technologies. And so to me, it's not just the hyperscale space and even not uh, specifically the hyperscale space as we move forward. Um, there's also uh, just regular businesses. Uh, I did a report on um, a survey that was done recently about asking businesses if they were incorporating machine learning technology. And more than half of them already had a machine learning strategy in place. And about 10 to 15%, I think, had already implemented them. So this is certainly good news for companies like IBM who are counting on enterprise customers picking up machine learning technology. Now, some of that will be done in the clouds, the cloud uh, controlled by hyperscale companies, but some will be done on premise and in other systems and even supercomputing centers. So um, anyway, the point is um, I, I think the deep learning and, and related technologies are, are scaling well beyond the hyperscale area. Um, so. Intersect 360 looks at the specific market of deep learning as about two to two and a half billion dollars as of last year, um, which is about 10%, about 10% the size of the, uh, the HPC market. And they, but they expect very high growth rates at least for a couple of years and then see it slow down uh, by the end of a five year period. Um, but you got to realize this doesn't include sort of all the other technologies associated with AI. I think they're, they're just looking at deep learning specifically, which is sort of the, the biggest piece of the pie right now as far as AI technologies. How am I doing on time here? Oh, good. Okay. Because it gets a little more wordy at the end. Um, so actually, we're almost at the end. So here's the Intersect 360 research sort of long-term projection for, for trends. They say, write these down, grade us in 2027. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, the fundamental drivers of HPC, they think, are going to go on forever. Um, you know, even traditional HPC with physics simulations and what they do, they don't see that abating. It's a... It's a $30 billion market today, and they just see the application areas expanding, more companies picking this up, even, even if they don't see sort of the hyperscale space and the AI space that's associated with that, they see, you know, this good 5% plus CAGR going on for uh, indefinitely. Um, the other thing I want to touch on, specialization, they, and I agree with this, specialization is, is a big deal today. We're seeing custom architectures and new architectures for HPC. We've, we've seen the Xeon Phi's and the GPUs as sort of semi-custom architectures for HPC. Um, what Japan is doing, or what uh, Fujitsu and, and ARM is doing with the ARM architecture, they're gonna build basically an HPC-specific version of ARM for that. And then there's um, certainly what Intel is doing with uh, you know, the Nirvana technology that we just heard about for, for the AI space. Um, there's a number of other areas where, where we're going to see it uh, as well in China where they're developing their own HPC processors. Um, and again, with um, interconnects, Omnipath, things like that that are very HPC specific, some of the silicon photonics technologies, some of the 3D memory stacks that we're seeing in, associated with some of these other processors. They're all sort of specialized HPC technologies something we haven't seen in the industry since uh, basically the, uh, you know, the loss of the, of the vector computers. Um, you can read the others. One of the other areas I wanted to touch on was the hyperscale market will have a big effect. So it's, again, there's this cross-pollination between HPC 
technologies and hyperscale with, with GPU and InfiniBand crossing over into hyperscale. Some of the software like Hadoop and MPI trading back and forth. Um, the other big point is the system configurations and, and product architectures are being influenced to a tremendous degree by the Googles and Amazons of the world. Uh, some recent news, Amazon, or recent news in, uh, from Google is they were going to be the first large-scale deployment of the Intel Skylake processors. Usually, in the past, that would have gone to the high-end supercomputers. You'd see those were the early, they, were, they got the pre-production versions of all, or not the pre-production, but the before general availability, the supercomputers would get those early uh, Xeons, and now it's, now it's Google. And that's because, basically, to Intel, Google is a more attractive customer than the Department of Energy. They, they buy more stuff, so it, it makes sense. Um, so what else do I want to say here? So, yeah, so they're looking at, at uh, even Intersect 360 is looking at AI and this augmented reality technologies as other things that are going to be driven by hyperscale. But as I said, I think those topic, those areas are actually going to be more generally distributed across uh, different domains it's not, and different user bases than just hyperscale. So here's my big prediction that I think is going to overshadow everything. Machine learning is the killer app for high performance computing. Um, I didn't come up with that. That was from uh, and the NVIDIA CEO, Jensen Huang, who talked about it two years ago. Um, so he, I think he was a little prescient there. But you can sort of see it just looking at the sort of the news feed. I mean, there's, there's basically millions of dollars being pumped into, as, by venture capitalists into thousands of, of AI startups over the past couple of years. Um, the market is not very big right now. It's, it's basically a tenth of the size of the HPC market. But projections that I've seen by reputable analysts see a growing to about the size of the HPC market within seven to eight years. So that's incredibly fast. That would be like if the Cray-1 supercomputer was invented in 2010, and then here we are in 2017, and we have a $30 billion market. That's how fast it is, and that's what we think AI is going towards. Um, it's, it's sort of a... Uh, it's in a sense, it's a can't miss technology. It's if if you just look at sort of like the news feed, it's there's basically a ton of new stories about AI startups and what they're doing and how it's being implemented across again not just the hyperscale hyperscale space, but by regular businesses from law firms to financial services organizations to everybody else, and they're all using basically some sort of high performance technology to do it, especially on the training side. Uh, so this is expanding the aperture for vendors for these high performance systems. And from the user side, as we're seeing, it's increasingly being incorporated by HPC users into those workflows. Um, it's hard to see where the balance is going to work out, as we saw from the, the uh, initial keynote uh, yesterday. It, it might turn out that each of the deep learning uh, and machine learning code, codes will, will shrink the, um, the demand for physics simulations because they'll be able to shrink sort of the, the number of simulations that'll need to be used because they'll, they'll intelligently look at those parameters and say, here's the simulations you need and here's the ones that you don't need to bother with. So it, it'll... It, it could affect HPC in that way and start to dominate the air and start to dominate the space. Um, that's sort of you know, all speculation at this point. But certainly, AI is going to be infused in every analytics application or every analytics workflow within five years. And that's a huge market. And that's good news for everybody, users and vendors. And that's it. I think I'm early. Yeah. Any questions? What, what's...
Yeah, what's, what's the CAGR you mean? The, the growth rate? Which is the trend that are driving. Oh, what's, what's driving that? Yeah. There's just more demand for, for storage. I mean, it's basically the, the big data phenomenon. There's more, there's more data being generated and stored, even for simulations. So there's, it's, as you go up, there's proportionally more data that's being generated. And Well, I mean, I, I sort of skipped over, but I mean, there's, I mean, there's uh, Intersect 360 think object storage is going to be a big thing coming up. But as far as the technology, it's going to be a mixture of old and new. Like with SSDs and disk, there's going to be a dynamic there that's going to play out over the next few years and see what the balance there is. But it's, um, yeah, I mean, there's different technologies that Intersect 360 tracks. To, to see how that's growing. But in general, it's just the amount of data that's sort of overwhelming the current storage systems. And there's, I mean, you could talk all day about what's going on there, but it's, um, it's a very dynamic area, but the demand is, is much, is, is bigger than servers in a sense. I mean, it's, it's still gonna be like a tenth of the total spend by HPC users, but it's, it's gonna be growing faster over the next five years. I think the CAG, CAGR, the compound growth rate, is something like 8%, which, which outstrips the general spending. Any other questions? You can ask me at dinner, too, but... I mean, I don't, I don't work for Intersect 360 anymore, but I sort of know, know it well enough. I could probably give you some insight. And if you want to talk about anything in the news, I could have gone on about deep learning forever since it's about a third of my stories now just like it's about a third of uh, the presentations at these conferences I go to now. Okay, thank you.